have for someone else. God knows who is here, right? The Lord gave this to me. Uh, and um, John chapter 18 will go with me. And the title of the message tonight would be No Escape. No Escape. Anybody, anybody ever feel like there was no escape? No way out. No way out. Praise God. Well, poor Peter. We're going to find out that Peter realizes that there is no escape. John chapter 18, verse number 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did the other disciples. That disciple was known as the high priest and went to Jesus into the palace of the high priest. And, but Peter stood at the door without and then went out that the other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, had spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. And the servants and the officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold. They say it was cold. They warmed themselves by the fire. And Jesus stood with them and warmed himself as well. And the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. They put him on trial. The trial was an accusation against the followers, the church, and the teaching. And Jesus answered and spake unto him openly the world. He spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple whether the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask then, which we heard me, what, ha what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And when he had said, and when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why why'd you hit me? And now Annas had set, sent him bound to... Caiaphas, the high priest, and Simon Peter stood and warmed himself, and they said therefore unto him, Art, art not thou also one of his disciples? And he denied it and said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did I not see thee in the garden with him? And Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock you can be seated tonight. Uh, I'm going to preach to you just for a few moments on this subject. No escape. The story of Peter is something that I believe that we can all relate to in some way or another. Just hours before this happened, Christ here on trial in the midnight hour, the coldness of the air had rushed in Peter denies that he even knew him. But just hours before this happened, Peter stood in the midst of the men and deliberated his undying allegiance for Christ. He said, wherever you go, I will follow. Whatever you face, Lord, I will join with you. No matter what happens to you, Lord, I will not deny you. He made a good start. As the Lord was betrayed in the garden with a kiss from Judas Iscariot, Peter was willing to stand for righteousness and not willing that his master should be taken away by the Roman garrison. He drew his sword and with righteous indignation, he tried with no doubt to take on the entire Roman army, he severed an ear in the process. Men scattered abroad and the Lord rebuked Peter and healed the wounded man. Jesus willingly attended to the subjection of the guards and left with them. 
But somewhere in the chill of the night, the cool winds of the evening air raced through the hot fire that burned in Peter's heart. Not sure where it was that he made, that the winds made Peter's zeal turn so cold. But the circumstances were more than Peter ever thought that he would face, and they were more than he could bear. Maybe it was the rebuke that the Lord had given to him for trying to defend him. Maybe it was the surrender of Jesus, and Jesus didn't put up a fight. Maybe it was the multitude of opposition. Maybe it was the weight of the Sanhedrin. Who knows what it was? What is it for us? What, what will do it for you? The accusations of his strange teachings? Will that make your zeal go cold? Maybe it's the loss of a loved one with no answers for why. Maybe that's what it will be. What will cause us to stumble? What has caused you to stumble tonight? Make no mistake today that you will stumble. There will be an air cold enough to snuff out that fire that you feel. It will come. Jesus told Peter it was coming. He said, as soon as Peter looked at him and said, Lord, I will go with you to the ends of the earth. He looked at him and he says, Peter, the devil has asked to sift you like wheat. He says, but I'm praying that through this coldness, through this trial, that your faith will not fail you. You will deny that you have ever known me even before the morning comes, Peter. You will stumble. Jesus already knows that we're going to stumble. Jesus understands tonight, and we need to understand tonight, that the devil is there in every corner waiting for us to see if this is the day that he can take you out. No one really knows what it was for Peter that caused him to do this. No one knows in the night what happened. But one thing is certain, he lost his passion. He lost his zeal. In a moment's time, he was ready to take on the entire Roman garrison that was there with one sword. But somewhere in the night, he lost it. So here it was, at the dawn, nearly approaching, still very dark outside, still very cold, the Bible says. Peter did what many do when they walk away from Jesus. They find themselves trying to warm themselves by the fire of the world. The fire that takes away the pain, that takes away the empty feeling. The abandonment of the Lord is empty, empty place. Hollow in its feeling. Lost. The fires that take away the pain and take away the empty feeling are the fires of the world. They're the things that we try to take the place of or try to bury the pain on, and that coldness. We warm ourselves with pills. We warm ourselves with alcohol. We warm ourselves with the different things of this world. We all know backsliders. And when a person backslides who came from truth, they go very, very far. And the reason why is they're trying to warm themselves because the coldness of the spirit that they don't feel anymore is something that no one else even knows. Elvis Presley, who was in the choir with Brother Linstead, in a united Pentecostal church at a very young age, walked away from the Lord Jesus and the church, only to find himself years later strung out on pills, strung out on alcohol, strung out on a fast life. And they say that his torment, his anguish was verbalized as he would weep and cry in the solitude of his closest friends, and he would say, I would give everything back if I could just feel the presence of the Lord one more time. If I could just feel the warmth 
the, of the fire of the Holy Ghost one more time. And it cost him his life. The fires of this world may warm you for a season, but eventually they will go out. They will leave you colder than it ever was when you walked up to the fire. It will leave you reeking with the smoke of ungodliness and it will leave you scared, scarred with the burns as you try to get too close. I'm preaching to somebody tonight. But what most of us figure out eventually anyway is no matter how far away we get from God, no matter how far away you get, you will realize one day that there is no escape. The woman at the fire looked at Peter and declared with most certainty, did not I see thee in the garden with him? Now, there are many people that follow Jesus. We know about 4,000 at one moment. We know about 5,000 at another. The Bible talks about the multitudes that, that followed around him. Entire cities were following him and with him and listening to him. And all of Jerusalem sang praises unto him as he entered into the city. But Peter was identified as the one who had been with him in the garden, the secret place, the place where only his disciples went. Not just your average follower, I might add. Just one, but the one who knows Jesus. The one who has a relationship with him. The one who knows his passion. The one who heard the prayer. The one who understands above all people the purpose. Peter realized that once you know him, in the way that Peter knew him, there was no escape. There was no way out. Once you have identified yourself with him through his name, and once you have followed him in the places that, no, not, that not many people would even dare to go, once you have experienced the power of his awesome glory and seen and touched the miracles that Peter had, once you have walked on water, seen blinded eyes open, once you have physically cast out devils, once you have been with him, there is no escape. You're marked. You're his. You belong to him. You wear a brand that everyone knows that there is something different about you than from anybody else. You act different. You look different. You're not like the rest of the people in the bar. You don't really fit in with the world, although you try. I'm, I'm here warming myself by the fire that everybody else is, but I'm singled out for some reason. That's because you're marked, sir. You can try to deny it, but somehow they know. You can cuss. You can try to talk as vulgar as they talk, but there's something about you that stands out. And they start asking questions. They, they press you. And they, as Peter said, no, I am not one of his. And, and they pressed on. And, and he says, no, I am sure of it. I know that you are one of his. You definitely are there. No, no, Peter pleaded. He pleaded. He says, I, I may have seen him like the rest of you, but not like that. Hey, I've gone to church, but no, 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 no. Not like you say. I'm just like everybody else here. But they looked on and they declared. And the woman looked at him and squinted her eyes. And she said, Peter, I see a mark. Peter cursed them and declared with most diligence. I am not one of his. And at that moment, he heard the rooster. And Peter remembered his heart beating desperately.
desperately inside of his chest. He, he felt trapped all of a sudden. He felt the anxiety of suffocation beginning to move up his neck. His breathing began to get tight. You know how it feels tonight when you deny him. When you are there at the flames of the world and someone says, where did you go to church? What's your background anyway? And at that moment, the Bible says, and the Lord turned and looked out a window and his eyes locked with Peter's eyes. And it says, and then Peter remembered the words of Jesus. He said, you will deny me. I can't imagine how cold it must have gotten for Peter. I can't imagine what conviction he must have felt when he knew I stood there and declared my allegiance. And he told me I would deny him, but I swore I wouldn't do it. And now he even's questioning, who, who am I? I? I thought I was someone else. I thought I could do it. I let him down. I let my friends down. I let my church down. But I let myself down. It's sad because the Bible is full of stories the same. Cain knew the sting of this mark all so well. After he had killed his brother, he turned his back on God completely, mocked the Lord, and I always say, talk back to God. So God put a mark on Cain. Cain said to God, the more, he said, God said, I'm going to put a mark on you, Cain, that no matter where you go, people are going to know who you are. The mark is going to identify you with me. Marked. And Cain said to God, he said, God, this is a curse that is more than I can bear. He said, God, would you please release me? He said, it shall come to pass that everyone that finds me will slay me. Wherever Cain wanders, wherever he goes in fear of his life, he at least thinks so. And like a man in debt, he thinks everybody he meets is a judge because he's marked. And God won't release him. God won't let him go. Some even believe that Cain was not afraid of his relatives killing him, but also the creatures of the earth. Paranoia strikes you when you walk away from God and you understand what Peter understands and you understand what Cain understands and that there is no escape. All of a sudden, everybody becomes your enemy. The protection that Cain once felt so close to the garden, he says, now I'm left alone in the world. Defend for myself. He said, God, they're going to kill me. I'm a fear for my life. No one's my friend. Looking behind his back at every corner. You know what I'm talking about because you've lived there. One commentator even stated that this scripture should better be translated that Cain wished death rather than to face a life marked with no escape, living out of the presence of God. The Bible says no one suffers more than those who suffer a spiritual death. No one suffers more than those who suffer spiritually. Where will you go, Cain? Where will you live? How will you fare? There's no escape. Mark. God will not release him. There's nothing he can do. You lie awake at night and you think about the time that you were with him in the garden. The miracles that you saw, the deliverances that you have been a part of or even have experienced for yourself. You lie awake at night, you can't sleep. 
his eyes locked with yours. There's no escape. Every time you deny him with your actions and with your lifestyle, you deny him once again. Every time you deny the mark, he puts you on trial. You put him on trial once again. They look at you and they say, I see that mark, and you deny it. You say, no, 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 this isn't the mark. This, is, this isn't, I'm not like that. That used to be, I used to, whatever the old days, but I'm not like that. I'm, I'm just like the rest of you now. I'm, I'm normal like the rest of you. But every time you do that, Jesus is here in the courtroom of sin, in the chambers of ungodly men. He's there in the bars with you. He's there on the chat room with you. He is there everywhere you go denying him in the relationship that you have with her or with him. On the one night stands that you spend and you know you shouldn't, he's there on trial. He stands trial for the sins of the world while the one who stood by him all of those times before, while he fed the 5,000, while he healed the leper, while he forgave the sins of many, while he baptized you in water and he filled you with his spirit. When he asked you, will you ever leave me? And you told him with your heart as pure as it could be, where would I go, Lord? Where would I go? Your words hold the words of eternal life. And yet, you're there denying him again and again. His doctrine's on trial. The church that you came from is on trial. Everybody that you told to come to the Hope Tabernacle, everybody you told to go to that Pentecostal church, it's on trial all over again because you're denying the mark. The spit in the face. The accusations begin to fly. The beating goes on and on and on. There's no escape. Judas was one of those who was with him in the garden as well. Judas saw everything that Peter saw. Judas was influenced to deny him by the spirit of Satan, but Judas learned the same lesson that Peter learned. That there was no way out. While Peter was denying Jesus by the campfire, Judas was feeling the tightness of breath, the overwhelming feeling of loss and failure. Much like Cain, the mark, the identification was not from the world, but for Judas, it was from within his own heart. Even if you're alone, there's no escape. Trying desperately to rid himself of this curse, throws the money on the floor of the temple. The coins jingle and spin to the ground. The dirt receives the blood money, but there's still that feeling. The kiss is still there. The blood of the lamb is still on my lips. The torment is still there. There's no escape. There's no escape. Or is there? Judas finds an escape by an old tree that's leaning over and outcropping at the edge of the cliff. In his haste to end his misery, he fails to see that the branch is not able to hold his weight. As he flings himself over the edge, hoping that the rope will snap his neck quickly and it all will end, the branches break and Judas falls to a tragic death. His body is destroyed and his soul is lost forever. The denial of such has either ended in total destruction of soul and body or in victorious recovery. The crucifixion the next day must have been hard for Peter to hear about. He wasn't there to see it. He went back fishing, trying in some way to gather himself to some sort of normalcy in the midst of the strange days that had just passed by. 
The last three years for Peter now must feel like just a big blur. Questions and doubts are filling his heart. Where is the promise of the new kingdom? Maybe it was all just a lie. Where's the power to deliver? He couldn't even deliver himself. Where's the power to deliver me from myself? Where was the zeal that I once had? Questioning himself, questioning the Lord, questioning the word, questioning everything. He says, I'll just go back to fishing. I'll stick to what I do best. What a fool I was to follow Jesus. Then Peter hears that the tomb is empty. Jesus is risen. He, he goes to check it out for himself. He, he runs in. He sees that there's no one there. And Could it be possible? Is there a way? No way. Not possible. Even if it were possible, he wouldn't want me back. I can't even imagine how Peter must have felt to know that there's a possibility that Jesus Christ might actually be alive. How much more that made him feel worse. That I might have to face him again someday. Not after I left him. There's no way. He would ever take me back. Not after what I did. Not after what I said. Not after the thoughts that I thought. I know that he knows the thoughts and the intent of my heart. I know that he knows on all this thing for three days. I hope it's not true. But then word came by the messenger. He said, Peter, Jesus wants me to find all of his disciples those who he trusted, those who he has a bond with, those whom he met with the garden. And Peter's thought, surely not me. Surely not I. And the man says, but Peter, that's just the strange thing. That the man who told me to come find the disciples specifically asked me to make sure I find Peter. As a matter of fact, he mentioned you by name. The only one. He said, Peter, he wants to have dinner with you and with the rest. Stand with me tonight. The boat approaches shore. John there with Peter and the rest are on the boat. John's young eyes are much keener than Peter's, and he sees the Lord before everyone else. He identifies him, and he says, there he is, by the campfire, cooking us breakfast. Peter lunges from the boat. He doesn't even wait for the, to the, for the anchor to fall. He comes out of the boat, and he runs, and he swims, and he leaps as hard as he can. He can't wait to get to him, and he gets to the Lord. And as he's running there and as he falls at the Lord's feet and the Lord tells him and he accepts him and he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Then I want you to go preach my message. Me, God. Me. And Peter realizes something at that moment in time. That there is no escape. No matter how far away you get from him. He's going to be there. No matter how far away you fall. No matter what you've said. No matter what you've done. There's no escape. He's there. He's going to find you. And he's going to accept you back. No matter how far away you venture from the garden, there's no escape. He realized something that Paul realized, and Paul wrote this. I don't know if Paul had a similar experience, 
But Paul wrote these words, and I'm sure that it's something that happened to Peter at that very moment in time. And he said, for I am now persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, no height, no depth, no other creature shall separate me from the Lord because there is no escape. There's no escape. No matter where you turn, his acceptance is going to be there. No matter what you say, as long as you come back to him, he will fall upon you and he will welcome you and he will hold you and he will give you the keys to his kingdom. Does anybody want to come back to Jesus tonight? Does anybody want to come back and restore some things that maybe you had walked away from? Uh, some commitments that you made to God that you haven't fulfilled yet. And you're, you're feeling pretty guilty about it, but, but still there's something. That you're going to come back and just say, God, I'm sorry. But tonight, tonight, tonight I want to tell you, God, I love you. Does anybody want to run to the mercy seat tonight? Does anybody want to run to the mercy seat tonight? Hallelujah. To the mercy of God. To the grace that follows me. You're marked tonight. You are marked. Don't deny it.
tonight, Jesus. Give us God tonight, I pray. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord, hallelujah. Continue to pray. Continue to pray in the name of Jesus. Let the Spirit of the Lord deal with you tonight, whatever you need. Just get it tonight. Get it tonight from the Lord. Hallelujah. Continue to pray. Continue to pray tonight in Jesus' name. He said that you could come to his presence. We should stay in a moment of prayer. There's a soul in a balance. He's got to make a decision tonight. I feel it imperative. We need to pray for our pastor that he'll have the right words to say. And they'll be receptive, received, and understood. Spend some time. Pray for Jared.
remember him there's he's going to come into a situation in his life and he's going to remember this night when he turned his back or he's going to remember this night that he changed his mind remember him tonight and uh, I pray that we always remember those who come and visit and know that they hear the truth and they make a decision one way or the other And this isn't about a way of life. This is life and death. Help us, Lord, always remember that. We dismiss us with prayer. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for that your word was sharp, that your word was true, and your word was strong. We pray that you will make it where it needs to be. Burn it in our hearts, all of us, Lord. God, that we find ourselves in a place where we have to deny you, that we will remember Peter, remember what happens, remember the pain of separation. Help us, oh God, to stay true to your word and true to you. In Jesus' name, dismiss us, protect us this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.